Coming up next on Conversations, NPR Morning Edition co-host Stevens Keep. Covering stories for NPR in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. I'd spent time in Afghanistan covering the war there. And of course, Pakistan was part of that story. In his first book, Instant City, Life and Death in Karachi, Inskeep tells the fascinating and complex story of Pakistan's most populated city. It tries to underline the way the city is growing and changing and the way it's an example of cities growing and changing around the world. In reporting the history, politics, religion, violence and growth of Karachi, Inskeep delivers keen insight into the turbulent relationship between Pakistan and the United States. It's Pakistan's gateway to the world, but it has served all of those functions for militants and criminals as well as ordinary citizens. NPR's Stephen Skeep, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Steve Inskeep, welcome to Conversations. Welcome to Seattle. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks very much. And I'm glad that I'm having the opportunity to talk to you in person <laughs> rather than just hearing you uh, on the radio uh, very early in the morning, even earlier on your time. If you'd like, we can Coast. adjourn to a car or <laughs> yeah. a bathroom somewhere so that it's more like normal. I mean, curious, what time do you get up? I get up about 2.40 in the morning Eastern time, uh, and I'm at work by about 3.45. Uh, but, of course, I have a co-host, Renee Montaigne, who is in Southern California, does the same thing only three hours earlier. So I never complain about my hours. I can have hers. <laughs> well, uh, we enjoy listening to you, you. And Morning Edition, obviously, is a very, very good news program. Well, let's talk about uh, this book, Instant City. How many times have you been to Pakistan? How many times have you been to Karachi? Um, not that many times, but seven, eight times, something like that. Uh, going back to about 2002, uh, I first went there, went to the city, covering stories for NPR in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. I'd spent time in Afghanistan covering the war there. And, of course, Pakistan was part of that story. I was then assigned to Pakistan and spent time in that city. The very first story that I covered was a court proceeding related to the killer of Daniel Pearl, the Wall Street Journal reporter. Yeah, he was killed in Karachi. He was killed in Karachi, kidnapped in Karachi, while he was attempting to meet uh, s supposed militants there. And he was lured into a trap. And so I began with a very negative uh, image of the city, of course. It's a very violent place where very bad things can happen. And it also was just a very large place that was hard to get a handle on as a reporter, as a foreigner from outside. But one of the things that I've learned about journalism is that the way you find a good story is by giving it time and also paying sustained attention. And so I was fortunate a number of years later to go back to Karachi. We did a whole series of stories on urban growth in the city and I began to understand some of the characters in the city and some of the architecture and the way the city worked. And I still didn't feel that I knew enough. And so I ended up going back and back and back, a series of visits that led to this book uh, which centers around a particular day in 2009, a violent day in 2009, but tries to underline the way the city is growing and changing and the way it's an example of cities growing and changing around the world. And on top of that, it uh, also has a connection to foreign policy uh, and America's uh, really uneasy relationship with Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uneasy is a kind word yeah. for what it's been lately. This is the economic heart of Pakistan. It's the most important city, the largest city in the country, the most diverse and complicated city in the country, and in some ways the most troubled city in Pakistan. It is also a city that is a port 
and American supplies pass through on the way to U.S. troops in Afghanistan. It's important in a very direct way. It's a city that has been used as a hiding place by al-Qaeda figures. Sometimes they're arrested there. So it is a gateway to Pakistan. It's a gateway to Central Asia. It's Pakistan's gateway to the world. But it has served all of those functions for militants and criminals as well as ordinary citizens. The history of this city um, is interesting because it also is tied strongly to the founder of Pakistan. Yeah. yeah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Jinnah. Yes. Jinnah uh, is a fascinating historical character. He's really one of my favorite characters that I've uh, researched in history. He was a lawyer. He was a Muslim. He was a leader of Indian Muslims in British India in the years leading up to independence uh, in 1947, independence for both India and Pakistan from Great Britain. British India was split into two nations. Jinnah began as this figure who sought unity between the Hindus who were the great majority of the subcontinent and the Muslims who were a huge minority. In the end though, he ended up accepting a divided country, dividing into two countries. He was going to be the leader, the father of the Muslim nation, Pakistan, but as that country's independence approached, he realized that he needed to reach out to other kinds of people, too. He gave a dramatic speech in Karachi on August 11, 1947, in which he called for his fellow citizens in this new nation to treat each other as equal citizens regardless of color, caste, or creed. There were Hindus who were part of his new country. There were Zoroastrians, there were Christians, there were other kinds of people, and he wanted the benefit of them all. Jinnah himself was a religious minority. He was a Shia, which is a minority in Pakistan, a minority sect of Islam in Pakistan. And right at the beginning of the country, he sought to include everyone. And that's one of the highest ideals of this country, although it's an ideal that has been violated right from the beginning. Right. He was a strong believer in diversity. Yeah. And uh, because the, the country and that city is just so diverse. Yeah, I don't know that the word was used, diversity, right. at that time, but you can see it in the, his approach. He reached out to leaders of different groups, uh, and you can see it in this, this city. It's one of the reasons that this particular city, I think, is so fascinating and provides almost a metaphor for the rest of us as we consider how to live in our cities, uh, which are so diverse. Jinnah realized that there were various kinds of people who had strengths that he was going to need if his country was going to succeed, that there were Hindu businessmen, that there were Zoroastrian traders, that there were a lot of educated people who were non-Muslim, that there were Muslim minorities like Jinnah himself uh, who deserved a place in the country, and he urged them all to work together for the benefit of, as he put it, the masses and the poor. One of the things that you tie uh, in the book to uh, really the whole story of what you're writing there in the history is that December day in 2009, yeah. I believe December 28th, yeah. day of a, of a uh, procession, the Ashura, is that what it's That's called? That's right, yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, this is a procession that happens every year. It commemorates uh, the death in battle of a man named Hussein more than a thousand years ago. Uh, and it is the moment of division, schism, between Shias and Sunnis, the two great sects of Islam. So it's an emotional day to begin with, and a day that could be divisive in some ways. Nevertheless, Shias have marched through the city of Karachi and many other cities around the world, every Ashura, and there had not necessarily been problems. On this particular time, in spite of thousands of police and paramilitary forces providing security, a bomb exploded and injured a number of people. And it was the beginning, not the end, of a series of violent events, including the appearance of men on the streets of the city a short distance away, a short time later, who burned hundreds of wholesale markets, burned some buildings to the ground. And I feel that these tragic episodes reveal some of the tensions of what is still today an incredibly diverse city, where you have a lot of fault lines, dividing lines, lines between different religious groups, 
lines between different ethnic groups, people speaking different languages, dividing lines between rich and poor, and a scramble for resources in a very crowded and chaotic place, and also a struggle for power, money, and land. I mentioned that these buildings burned down and that hundreds of shops were destroyed. That suddenly created a bunch of vacant real estate mm -hmm. in the center of the city, and it became an immediate controversy. Uh, who would get the who would get the land? Who would get the property? Highly valued land. In yeah. Such a yeah. Tightly densely populated. Yeah. City. And there's been immense land speculation. Uh, I don't think you can quite say there's been a housing bubble in Pakistan the way there was in recent years in the United States. But there has been at the far reaches of this metropolitan area a scramble for property. And what I mean is that effectively public land land that is supposed to belong to villages or to the provincial government has been grabbed in an illicit way by developers, crime bosses, call them what you want them uh, to be, uh, and sliced up into individual lots and either held for speculation or sold to poor people. And it's estimated that sometimes we're talking about 100,000 home lots per year. It's interesting that some of the people that you talk to actually call these, uh, what, real estate mafias, they call them? Land mafias. Land yes, mafias. the land yeah, mafia. Right. It's a yeah. really common phrase. And actually, when I first was uh, paying attention to this a few years ago, I, it was just funny, first off, to hear the word mafia in <laughs> Pakistan. And second, having heard it, I was a little dubious of the construct. It sounded like a cartoon. And as a reporter, when you hear that kind of cartoonish description, you begin to wonder if anything's wrong. You should begin to wonder if something's wrong and it's a more complicated story. Uh, of course, you get into it and you realize there really are people who probably deserve that name. But it's not like uh, Don Corleone in the back room. It may very well be a local politician or a provincial politician or just some guy trying to make a living. You found highly educated people, very rich people, mm -hmm. poor people, people in the middle just trying to scratch out a living, yeah. people from the rural areas coming in, speaking different languages. What does that tell us about Pakistan, and, and how does that tie to the difficult relationship that the U.S. has? Well, I think there's an important point to make, that there is an incredible diversity of people there and an incredible diversity of beliefs and a diversity of ideas about what this deeply troubled country should be. The extremists right now in Pakistan are the loudest by far because they kill people, because they set off explosions, because they have loud conservative clerics, and because they intimidate and silence people who disagree with them. And yet, when you look at the history of the country, or when you travel around and talk to people, you recognize that there is a tradition in Pakistan that is different, that goes back to the founder of the country, that involves a richer look at people and more tolerance and a greater variety of belief. And that tradition has been suppressed, and yet it's still widely believed that the great mass of Pakistanis are broadly tolerant and broadly understanding of other people. And the best evidence that you have of that is that when conservative Islamist parties run in national elections, as they commonly do, they rarely get even 10% of the vote. Much larger percentages of the vote go to major political parties which have their flaws and which dabble in religious politics, but still have a variety of positions and views that go well beyond religion. It's just a more complicated place than it seems at first. And that, in some ways, is positive because it means that the really loud voices that dominate now aren't all that's there. And from the American perspective, the cause is not necessarily hopeless. But they still have to deal with those voices that yeah. are extreme, which then causes Hillary Clinton to come into town yeah. along with others to say Pakistan needs to get its act together and uh, having her berate the government. Well, yeah, and that's uh, in some ways an even more complicated situation because there we're dealing with the military and the government, the national security institutions that effectively control foreign policy have their own layers of complexity and difficulty. Now. The people at the top 
of the Army of Pakistan, as far as anyone can tell, are they're, they're not Islamist extremists. Uh, they are nationalists, however. They are Pakistani nationalists, and they have a very vivid idea of their country's national interests. From the perspective of an American diplomat, they've got it all wrong. They're too obsessed with India, for example, yeah. and they're too obsessed with making sure they have a role in whatever happens in Afghanistan after the United States military leaves. But they have been insisting on their version of their national interests. And the civilian politicians, who have very little say in foreign policy to begin with, have essentially been backing them up. Now, that's caused complexity for someone like Hillary Clinton or General David Petraeus, now the head of the CIA, or the Americans fighting the war in Afghanistan, because you have these groups like this Haqqani network right. up by the border, which, uh, which Americans very much want to eliminate, but which Pakistanis see in a different way. They will argue that they don't have the resources to go after the Haqqanis. And there may actually be some truth to that because they've sent so many troops to fight insurgents elsewhere. They, this is a country very much at war with itself. But there is also this feeling among the Americans that Pakistan doesn't quite want to give up the Haqqanis, that they see in the Haqqanis a group that could play a role in Afghanistan in the future and could be very helpful to Pakistan. That is hard for Americans to take, knowing as they do the way that the Haqqanis have been attacking and killing Americans. Does Pakistan have an inferiority complex, particularly I since... I love that. Uh, yeah, that's a question. Yeah. Since, <laughs> you know, they've always had to deal with India mm -hmm. and the fact that they split from India yeah. and they still have the clashes and fighting over certain areas. I think that, yeah, I mean, inferiority complex, is that psychologically exactly what it is? I don't know. But roughly speaking, I think you're, you're driving at something really significant. They did go through this bitter separation with India. People compare it to a couple that's been through a bitter divorce. They compare it to two brothers who have not been getting along. I mean, there are these familial images that people bring up and metaphors that people bring up, and I think that there's some appropriateness to that. These are two peoples who in many ways are still one people. Yeah. And when Pakistanis travel across the border to India or people come the other way, they tend to remark on the similarities as much as, as the differences. They are two countries that face many of the same problems, massive population, mass illiteracy, just to name a couple, infrastructure that crumbles, corruption in the government. And yet India is seen as a country that's on the way up, and Pakistan is seen as a country that's on the way down. And part of the reason is that India has had a more stable government for all of that government's flaws. They haven't had repeated military coups as Pakistan has. Uh, another reason is simply that India is bigger. And it's turned out to be a vast market and a vast pool of labor for the United States. And India has been stable enough that American companies and other kinds of companies can come in and grab those resources. And Indian entrepreneurs, of course, have been putting together huge companies that are able to take advantage of a huge market. Pakistan is considerably smaller, even though it's still one of the largest nations on Earth. And because of its conflict with India, it hasn't had the access to that huge market which suggests that India actually, actually could be part of the solution. Mm. If relations were to improve between those two countries, it is not impossible to see Pakistan's economy being much stronger than it is and the country having money to deal with a lot of the problems that it can't afford to deal with right now. The fact, too, that um, Pakistan has a nuclear connection. A little awkward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for Americans to understand the importance of this country, does it come down to that? Well, I think for a lot of Americans it does. Uh, there's a simple journalistic shorthand that people drop into news stories about Pakistan to remind you why they're important. Nuclear right. armed nation could fall into the terrorist hands at any time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and it is reasonable to worry about nuclear security in a place like this. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. Um, it is a little less reasonable to worry about some kind of Islamist takeover, some kind of Iran revolution in which the government itself would fall into the hands of extremists who would use the weapons. Uh, I think very few experts and analysts would see that around the corner. The extremists remain a minority, even though they are a frightening minority. Um, 
But there are other problems that bear watching as well. This is a society that has a lot of strength and a lot of resilience, but also a lot of severe long-term problems having to do with simple things like education or just providing adequate electricity. There are blackouts every day in a city like Karachi. Karachi. And if you're worried about the long-term future of this nuclear-armed nation, then those are things to worry about because you don't want it to get so bad that it begins to be a failed state. There are people who call it a failed state now. That seems extreme to me. But it's also not impossible that it gets that bad. It was interesting that uh, one of the quotes from uh, a businessman, I believe it was a businessman that you had talked to, uh, said that, yes, we're, uh, we're not a poor nation. We're a poorly managed nation. Yes, yes, really insightful remark. Yeah. There is tremendous human capital in this country. And there are, you know, a fair number of rich people. You can see that in Karachi. You go along the waterfront, you see glass towers, you see new upscale shops and stores. Uh, you see an upper class. You see an elite. There are some very nice neighborhoods and very big houses, almost like South Asian versions of McMansions uh, here and there in the city, and some even more spectacular houses as well. There are people who make a lot of money, and there are a lot of resources there, but it is not what it could be. And just in the last few months, uh, as I read the Pakistani press, I mean, there was an article which tried to compare Pakistan's economy to India. And if you go to the stock exchange in Karachi, which is the financial center of the country, it's the New York of the country in that way, and look at the top 25 countries and add up their total value, uh, there are a number of individual billionaires in India who could just buy them all. That's how much more money there is in India right now. That's how much more wealth is being created in India right now. And so you have a country that seems to this businessman, along with a lot of other people, to be punching below its weight, to be performing below its potential. The killing of Osama bin Laden and the fact that it was in Pakistan. Yeah. The sense that you got from the people there. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know that you had been there since that had happened. I have. But, uh, yeah. but the feeling that they have, knowing that the, that happened and how Americans have viewed that since. It uh, was a great embarrassment for the country. And I was there in the weeks after bin Laden was killed. And the first thing that happened, I just interviewed people on the street and easily found plenty of people who were willing to claim that bin Laden wasn't even dead. Really? They doubted it. They suspected some kind of conspiracy. Maybe he was dead all along, and the Americans are only making this announcement now. Uh, maybe he's alive somewhere and being hidden. Maybe he never existed in the first place. And there were some people who were just fans of bin Laden in the way that you might be a fan of Jesse James. He was a robber who uh, stuck it to people that they resent. I, I'm not defending that point of view. I'm reporting that right. point of view. And there were a lot of people who, for these kinds of reasons, said they completely doubted the story the United States told about bin Laden. Uh, and I think that that was a reflection of the angst, of the embarrassment, of the resentment of the United States. Uh, and on a human level, you can understand that. We are so important to this country they think of themselves, and they, I don't mean everyone, but uh, you'll talk to Pakistanis and you'll hear someone say, we are a client state of the Americans, meaning they understand themselves sometimes to be subordinate to another nation. And it's easy to resent that. We certainly would resent that. Uh, and then the resentment has been built up by a series of incidents this year, not just the bin Laden raid, right. but the capture of Raymond Davis, who turned out to be a CIA contractor who killed two people on the streets of Lahore or was accused of that crime, uh, and a number of other incidents as well, accusations made about that Haqqani network. One incident after another has reminded Pakistanis that the relationship with their patron is bad. Reporting from there, um, were you concerned about your own safety? You have to be just to be realistic. And it's not the safest country to go. But uh, as a journalist, wherever I have been, including considerably more dangerous places like Afghanistan or Iraq, I, you take a number of basic precautions. Uh, you spend the night in a secure place. You figure out who you're going to see. You go and see them, go about your business, and you come back again. 
Uh, and if it's a somewhat hazardous situation, which it sometimes is, you just you don't dawdle. You keep a low profile. You don't call attention to yourself. You keep moving. But you talk to who you want to see and who you need to see because you're there to do your job. And if you're going to go all that way, you might as well go meet people. And you get reassurance from that part because you discover that so many people actually are kind and welcoming and hospitable. There's a great culture of hospitality in that part of the world, and uh, I was grateful for it. And people understood that I was a foreigner and frankly looked out for my security more really? than I might. Uh, and we're talking about it even in situations where I wasn't particularly concerned. So you can get around as a reporter and you can, you can talk to people. You just have to think about how you do it. Do you usually have security with you? No. No. Um, and this is a belief that I've had and that my colleagues at NPR have had, many of them, for a long time. Security guards are occasionally necessary. For example, in Iraq, where you had to live for a while in really what was a fortress with guard towers. But in general, security guards just call attention to you. They announce that you're somebody big who may be of interest to somebody with even more guns than your guards. And I've always believed that having a gun around me uh, in that situation or a gunman whose own provenance I may not know a lot about uh, is it increases the likelihood that a gun is going to be fired around me. Right. And I'd rather travel low profile and go see people and put some faith in human nature. In many ways, that's safer than trying to guard absolutely against any possible eventuality. Right. The book is called Instant City, Life and Death in Karachi. It's a very good read, great uh, background and history about a city that uh, I did not know was uh, as big as it was or as that uh, complex as it is. Stephen Skeep, thank you very much. We'll uh, listen to you on the radio. Thank you. All right. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.